in the remote forests of Sumatra, Indonesia, lives one of the world's rarest tiger species. Almost 50% of Sumatra's forests have disappeared in the last 25 years. Demand for land has increased for agriculture, logging, and oil palm plantations. And where tigers and humans meet, the conflict ends in tragedy. In 2009, eight Indonesians were killed in a spate of brutal attacks. But some have vowed to protect the endangered cat at any cost. British tiger expert Tom Maddox and Indonesian vet Johanna Trihastuti are fighting to keep the species alive. With less than 400 Sumatran tigers in the wild, time is running out. Can Sumatra's tigers be kept from extinction? And can the killing be stopped? This is Sumatra, Indonesia, the sixth largest island on the planet. A biodiversity hotspot. These tropical rainforests are home to thousands of plant and animal species. And one iconic cat, the Sumatran tiger. With less than 400 left in the wild, it's critically endangered and could be the first large predator to become extinct this century. It was separated from other Asian tigers around 100,000 years ago. Rising sea levels isolated Sumatra, making this tiger genetically unique. It's the smallest tiger in the world, evolved for living and hunting in this rainforest. It has the largest canine teeth of any land-based carnivore and a jaw that can exert 450 kilograms of force per square inch. It's believed to be one of the most aggressive of all tigers and built for the kill. It's late afternoon on January the 23rd, 2009. Three rubber tappers are finishing a day's work in the forests of Jambi, East Sumatra. They head back to a basic hut. Unaware that they are in tiger territory. A Sumatran tiger, a formidable ambush predator, lurks silently nearby. Early the next morning, Arbayin Mutalip wakes before his companions. In a matter of seconds, he is attacked from behind, the full force of the tiger's jaw crushing his neck. The tiger retreats into the forest but it's too late for Mutalib. He did not stand a chance against this top predator. The men entered the forest on the border of the national park to harvest wild rubber. Humans aren't normal prey for tigers and this attack could just have been an instinctive reaction to another large mammal threatening its territory. But five days later, a second gruesome attack, just 15 kilometers from the last, would trigger the hunt for a man-eater. Uh, jadi waktu pertama kali kita masuk, setelah kita temukan di situ ada korban, langsung kita mengeluarkan tembakan itu untuk mengusir dengan tujuan mengusir harimau. 
Heifer Edison is one of Jambi's forest rangers. He was called to the scene of a tiger attack, but when he got there, the predator hadn't left. Sudah keluar ke tenak tembakan, saya bergerak sedikit. Itu ternyata dia ada di sana, dia langsung loncat dan saya langsung lari ke atas sini. Dan saya ternyata melihatnya ada ada di sana dan saya juga mengeluarkan tembakan. The only survivor told Heifer the terrifying story of the previous night. Ya inilah ini pondok di mana harimau mengganas memangsa manusia itu. Three illegal loggers are asleep inside. At 11 p.m., the men are woken by noises. Something begins to scratch at the walls. They are terrified. Itu kalau dilihat dari jejaknya itu harimau mulai mengambil awalan seperti ini. Jadi mulai mengambil awalan. Dia sudah seperti ini dan loncatnya itu seperti di sini dia langsung terbangnya seperti itu. One man jumps up to save his nephew. But the boy is frozen with fear. His uncle makes an agonizing decision. Sepamannya berusaha menyelamatkan diri sendiri. Dia langsung loncat keluar lewat lewat ini. Dia langsung keluar dan lari sejauh mungkin. As he runs, the boy's screams pierce through the forest. The tiger claims two more victims. The following day, the search party is shocked. The men appear to have been partially eaten. Could these tigers now be seeing humans as food? The hunt is on for Jambi's first man-eater. The forest rangers, along with conservationists, mobilize to catch the tiger before it kills again. Rangers turn to locals for help. A farmer has found fresh tiger prints in an oil palm plantation only four kilometers from his village. There is little food here. These plantations only support up to 15% of the tiger's natural prey. It could mean the tiger was forced to attack humans out of starvation and it could kill again. The patrol needs to catch it fast. They bait a heavy steel cage with a live goat protected behind bars. It produces a strong aroma and the tigers have an excellent sense of smell. Can this cage hold a 100 kilogram predator? Tigers hunt at night, so the rangers will leave the trap until morning. <laughs> After sundown, a hunter is on the prowl. It creeps silently towards the cage and circles it, probing for a way in. On the morning of February 11th, 2009, forest rangers returned to a tiger trap in Jambi, Sumatra. And this dramatic scene is captured by the team's home video camera. An 82 kilogram female tiger has been caught. The team keep their distance. They aren't certain the cage can withstand her strength. 
Water is thrown to cool her down. She's terrified and wounded from hitting the cage. A quick decision is made to take her to the nearest zoo for treatment. Right now, it's impossible to tell if this female is responsible for the attacks. She needs protecting from angry locals, and the rangers feel the safest place for her is behind bars in Jambi Zoo. Guilty or innocent, her reputation as a killer is a death warrant. This is the center of the tiger conflict. Murbak is one of the most remote areas in Sumatra and one of the last refuges for tigers. But half of it has been allocated to the logging industry and it's rapidly disappearing. Once the trees have gone, the palm oil industry takes over. Oil palm plantations cover almost three million hectares of Borneo and Sumatra, a booming $1.4 billion business. When land is taken up by oil palm plantations, the ecosystem is affected, leaving open spaces and less diversity of prey for the tigers. As the natural forest diminishes, conflict between humans and tigers escalates, and history has shown that a tiger always loses. The Indonesian archipelago has already seen two tiger subspecies become extinct, the Javan and the Balinese. Tigers are solitary animals. Each one needs as much as 80 square kilometers of forest to hunt in. Here in Burbank, that space is running out. Forcing the tiger into contact with illegal loggers, rubber tappers and poachers. One man is on a mission to keep them apart and protect the tiger's last territory. Tom Maddox is manager of the Zoological Society of London's Indonesian projects. He is racing to find a solution. People need to understand that, you know, this is not tigers being evil or bad. Tigers are large predators if, if they meet people. This is a, a risk that's going to happen. The first focus has got to be on people encroaching into the forest, reducing the habitat that's left. Burbank is the front line. If this forest is cleared by illegal loggers, it could be converted to oil palm, and the tiger's last sanctuary will be gone forever. A national park ranger has received a tip that illegal loggers are operating in the area. Tom and his team join him on patrol. Three kilometers into the forest, they find a large camp. But there's nobody in sight. It looks like it's been just abandoned. There's clothes out to dry and there's cooking things. There's a cup of tea half finished there. Um, so either hiding around in the forest somewhere or they've, they've headed back some other way. It soon becomes obvious that this is a carefully planned logging operation. We've got various cut wood around. What seems to be happening is that they're transporting the wood out of here down this drainage ditch and it's coming out of the forest along these tracks here. Chainsaws start up in the distance. The loggers don't know there's a patrol nearby. Tom risks going further into the forest, into tiger territory. But as he gets closer, the chainsaws stop. This is where they were working, but they've run off. You can still smell it, it still smells of freshly cut wood. So they were just working here a few minutes ago. Possibly see how they knew we were coming. It's charging up a mobile phone battery just there. The ranger will confiscate the chainsaws and bring them back to the National Park headquarters. Similar to the drugs trade, the illegal logging industry is highly organized and often with powerful political connections. Desperate to make a living, villagers get pulled into chainsaw loan deals with logging companies that they have to pay off 
by cutting down trees. For Tom, this um, is a bittersweet victory. Well, it's quite sad. It's sad seeing all this. But it's, it's just so complicated because it's not... The guys that run off, they're not necessarily the, the bad guys behind this. It's, uh, they're going to be paid by somebody else. Tom may have temporarily saved these trees, but this forest is sporadically policed and the loggers will be back. If Tom can prove Burback holds a viable population of tigers, he can build a case to protect it from further destruction and in turn help prevent more attacks on humans. His team are setting up camera traps, one method of finding out how many tigers are in this forest. They look for jungle paths, clear walkways that tigers routinely use. This is one of our camera traps. So the camera trap has got a simple point and shoot camera up in the top and then it's got a sensor down here and the sensor will trigger the camera when a tiger walks past. The only way to count wild tigers is by photographing and identifying each one. Every tiger has an individual stripe pattern, like a barcode on each animal. We need to get left and right sides of a tiger um, because then we can be sure we can identify it. So we have to have another one over here. So this is covered up at the moment so that it doesn't fire. So we've got cameras on either side and the theory is, is that the tiger walks down the middle here and we get photographs left and right sides at the same time. The team move further into the forest along a potential tiger highway. These tigers are so rare that in seven years, Tom has only ever seen wild tigers through photographs. Today, they think they've found a new location and two large tiger prints confirm the need for a camera to be placed here. You've got the front foot here and there's a back foot on top of it as it's walked on top. Um, so this part here is this part of the track, goes like that. Um, the front foot is a bit bigger because that's where all the muscle of a tiger is, so the front feet are, are usually a bit bigger. Um, and just from the size of this one, I'm pretty sure this is a, a male. It's quite a large one. The print is a great sign. It means that tigers are using this route. But further down the trail, the team uncover a crudely designed animal trap. This would have been dug out. This would have been a deeper hole. It would have been covered with this and probably covered with the leaves and so on so you couldn't see it. The snare would have come through here. That would be around the edge of the hole like that. And the spring that gives the tension, that's that diagonal branch up there, the slanting one. So they would have pulled that right back until it was really, really... Uh, very, very tense. And then when the tiger comes along and it steps on this, it would have released the trigger, that branch would have sprung up and it would have pinned the paw to the side here, with the snare around it like that. You just wouldn't be able to get it away. In Sumatra, illegal poaching accounts for 78% of tiger deaths. Just meters from the trap, a pile of animal fur confirms Tom's worst fears. Pretty sure that this is tiger fur, um, and partly because of the way it looks, but also partly because of the damage we've got around some of the branches around this area. A lot of the branches have been stripped, um, which is something you get when a tiger's been uh, caught in a snare and it's going crazy trying to rake all the trees around it. Over 241 kilometers away, near Karinchi National Park in West Sumatra, another tiger is captured by forest rangers, a large male accused of killing livestock, has been caught with a baited trap. The team named the tiger Sasa. Authorities think humans could be its next target and need to relocate him. Once a tiger has been captured, there are two options. Either they are moved to a remote location away from humans, or they are sent to local zoos or breeding centers and spend the rest of their lives behind bars. Salma, the young female accused of killing three people, is being kept in Jambi Zoo on display to a curious public. 
rumors spread about how many people she killed. Dapat di Muara Jambi yang telah memangsa 15 orang masyarakat di sana. The brutality of the attacks has stunned the local community, and they're happy to see her caged. Tom doesn't want Sasa, the big male, to be put behind bars in a zoo like Salma. He wants to try the second option, translocation, moving a tiger out of the conflict area and into a more remote national park. No one really knows if translocation works. It is sometimes done quickly in response to tiger conflict. Tom is about to put these systems to the test. He wants to put a GPS satellite collar on Sasa. If this works, the data they get could provide a solution to the tiger conflict. We don't know anything about these tigers when they get moved like this. We don't know if it's a successful thing to do. We don't know. Um, we don't know if the tiger is going to try and head back to where it came from, or if it's going to go and disturb anybody else. So we really need this this information to keep tabs on it, really. The Zoological Society of London conducts routine tests on Sasa to gauge his health. And they fit him with a GPS tracking collar. This way they can learn about tiger movements. If they're too close to human populations, Tom can try to intervene. The team drives Sasa to a remote location on the border of Karinchi National Park to release him far away from hunters and villagers. This incredible moment of freedom is captured on two hidden cameras. Deep in Burbach's forest, Tom waits patiently. The collar should transmit every eight hours, sending Tom updates via email. But 24 hours after Sasa's release, he hasn't had a single update. The collar takes a GPS position every hour, and then it sends us that information every eight hours. So by now, we should have had two or three emails, really. So rather worrying we haven't had anything. A few hours later, and there's still nothing. Okay. It's all been working fine. I was getting email positions where it was in the car on the road down. But um, just a couple of hours before it, re it reached where they want to release him, um, I've not had any more information through since then, which is a little bit worrying. Tom is concerned the collar may have broken as the tiger was released. Or even worse, that the tiger dives straight into a hunter's trap. The next morning brings some better news. Sasa's collar has started transmitting. This means the test has worked. Tom can now track Sasa's every move. It's been a bit of a delay, but we've got emails through now. Um, so we can see where the tiger's been going for the last few hours. And it seems now, in the last hour or so, he's now actually back inside the National Park. Um, so everything's looking good. Good news. The next week will be critical, and Tom will monitor his movements closely, hoping he doesn't leave the National Park. But Salma, the female tiger accused of killing three humans, has been locked up in a small cage in Jambi Zoo. There has been another killing in the same area as Salma's capture. Speculation begins about Summer's guilt. Is she the actual killer, or is the man-eater still out there? Vet Johanna Trihastuti has come to give Selma the tiger accused of killing three people a medical checkup. The test results will determine her health and help decide what to do with her next.
Dr. Johanna prepares a sedative, metatomidine and ketamine, a combination of drugs often used for wild big cats. She doesn't know Salma's exact weight, so she needs to make an estimate to calculate the dosage. They use a blowpipe to inject her with the sedative. She's aggressive, and the first shot doesn't hit the intended target securely enough. They try again. It works. They don't want to keep her under anesthetic for long. Salma's weight and size are indicators of her health. Berat badannya ternyata jauh dari prediksi berat badan saya pada saat estimasi. With very little space to roam, Salma has put on 23 kilograms. Blood samples are taken to analyze her organ functions and her DNA will be tested and kept on record. Dr. Johanna measures her teeth to determine her age and if she's fit enough to go back to the wild. She's roughly seven years old and her teeth are in good condition, which means she'll be able to catch prey if released. But then, a dangerous turn of events. Salma's temperature spikes. She has heat stroke. Jadi itu membuat saya sangat khawatir karena kalau itu tidak diatasi akan terjadi kolapsnya pembuluh darah, shock bisa menyebabkan kematian. To bring her temperature down quickly, they wipe rubbing alcohol over Salma's body. Ten minutes later, her temperature drops to a more stable 39 degrees Celsius. It's a relief, but it's clear that after months in a small cage, her health has worsened. Kept here any longer, she could die. But the accusations against her are too great to release her back into the wild. She could end up in a detention center for many years. This is Taman Safari Park, Indonesia, home to a center for captured wild Sumatran tigers. Asiad has spent the last 10 years as keeper to a row of caged tigers. Most tigers in this facility have killed humans and livestock. Jadi, biasa aja. Yang penting kita selalu waspada. Jangan, jangan apa? Terburu-buru kalau kerja itu. Jadi harus selalu dicek, dicek, cek kunci-kunci itu. At 17 years old, Jabul is the center's oldest tiger. In captivity, tigers can live for 20 years. In the wild, they rarely live beyond 15. Jabung is the most aggressive tiger in the center. He has never lost the instinct to kill. Dia karena di hutan itu udah makan empat orang, jadi kalau ngelihat orang pengennya nerkam-nerkam terus. Jadi kita harus waspada sama si jabung ini. Jadi jangan sampai kebuka. Kalau kebuka udah fatal. It's not easy keeping 40 carnivores. Every month, these tigers eat over 200 kilograms of beef and kangaroo meat, low in cholesterol and high in protein. Diet and exercise prevent them from becoming overweight. In the wild, Sumatran tigers feed mainly on wild boar and deer. 
eating up to 35 kilograms of meat in one go and making a meal last for days. When full, it will cover the carcass and return only when it is hungry again. The tigers in this facility will never hunt in the wild again. Although spared potential death from poachers, these tigers will have to live out their lives in captivity. Kalau misalkan uh, ini emang dia habitatnya di hutan, emang dia lebih baik di hutan. Tapi namanya harimau ini harimau bermasalah. Jadi mau mau nggak mau kita selamatkan di di breeding center ini daripada mereka tangkap sama uh, penduduk di sana terus mereka dibunuh karena uh, apa nilai ini sangat tinggi sekali kan apa dari kulitnya dari taringnya dari kukunya 40 years ago this center had an influx of conflict tigers and no forest to release them in Taman Safari staff teamed up with other Indonesian zoos to start breeding these critically endangered tigers to help keep the species alive. Today, it's one of the largest breeding facilities for Sumatran tigers in the world. Tony Sumampau, the director of the center, is the man behind the breeding program. Keeping wild tigers behind bars and breeding them is controversial, but this tiger facility could hold the future of the species in its gene bank. Not everybody agree with what we have done here. Uh, the reason is because they think that the tiger should be in the wild all the time. If we have a, a nice uh, habitat for them to release, it would be fine, but nowadays it's difficult to have a big habitat for releasing the tigers, especially the problem tiger, man eater tiger. So we put them in the breeding environment so we can breed them, so we can uh, uh, have a very strong gene pool of the Sumatran tigers. Indonesia has already lost two tiger subspecies, the Balinese and the Javanese tigers. Both species could have been kept alive in zoos with the help of a breeding program. It's an irony, but with less than 400 in the wild, life behind bars for these Sumatran tigers could help the survival of the entire species. Dr. Johanna, who treated Salma the young female, is responsible for all the tigers at the center. At the moment, Taman Safari has 33 Sumatran tigers to its name, and that number is about to increase. One of the tigers, Desi, is two months pregnant. <laughs> Terus vitamin, jangan lupa vitamin kalau sana D seperti biasa, empat tablet, terus multivitamin lewat makan. A tiger's gestation period is around a hundred days, so Daisy has another month before she gives birth. A new birth is a tense time here, and the staff will be on call 24/7. Tapi kondisinya sih sekarang dia kondisinya bagus ya. E, puntingnya juga sudah mulai kelihatan membesar, perutnya juga sedikit sudah mulai membesar. E, nafsu makannya bagus. Secara umum kondisinya sih bagus. Arsiad has a personal interest in making sure Desi has a smooth pregnancy. Saya percaya ya Desi itu yang betina itu. Mungkin dia apa? Enggak terlalu agresif seperti yang lain tetap kita juga harus waspada tapi saya paling senang lihat si Desi itu. Senang aja saya ngelihat dia ini. Karena apa ya dia uh, bisa apa bikin bangga saya karena dia kalau ya itu tadi kalau misalkan dia lahirin dia selalu ngerawat anaknya dengan baik. 
but breeding endangered tigers isn't easy. In the middle of her rounds, Johanna gets a worrying call about some of the newly born cubs. The center's newest members were born in December last year. Rejected by their mother, the two-month-old brother's survival is in the hands of Taman's dedicated team of foster parent vets. Every new birth strengthens the Sumatran tiger gene pool. Two-month-old brothers, Yuda and Wira, depend fully on their surrogate mothers, needing to be fed every four hours, just like a human baby. But Yuda is having trouble swallowing. If he can't get nourishment, he won't survive long. Oh iya ini mbak, dia kan nggak radang mm -hmm. karena nggak panas, jadi di ini aja, di uh, dipijit rutin sehari tiga kali mm -hmm. pagi sore gitu mbak mbak Sri sendiri yang ini yeah. terus paling tambah kalsium ya. If his neck doesn't straighten out, he won't be able to eat solid food stopping him from developing. <coughs> Johanna shows the vet's assistant how to prepare Kalsinya extra calcium for the cub. Si Yuda ini bermasalah dengan dengan problem dengan muskulusnya kemungkinan tapi bukan karena radang atau infeksi kemungkinan dulu mungkin uh, pernah ke inja induknya atau sesuatu yang kita nggak tahu pasti jadi di sini harus dirawat di nurser ini karena harus rutin di di terapi di pijit sehari tiga kali dan dibantu dengan kalsium yang supaya mudah pemberiannya dicampur dengan susu. They will all be keeping a close eye on Yuda. Karena memang tugas kami menyelamatkan dia sampai bisa survive sampai kalau bisa sampai beranak lagi. When they're four months old, Wira and Yuda will be returned to the breeding center, hoping that in the future they will mate and produce a new generation of Sumatran tigers to help keep the species alive. Collecting detailed records of which tigers mate and the offspring they produce helps to keep the gene pool pure. And that's Dr. Ligaya Tumbelaka's job. She manages the Sumatran Tigers database and keeps all DNA samples in the center's gene bank. Each sample is vitally important. With this gene bank, we can analyze whether certain tiger is really Sumatran tiger or not. This stops inbreeding, which could harm the future of the species. With so few tigers left, one day more desperate measures may have to be considered. If we think that maybe in the future the number will get lower, we need to think about certain technology maybe. We use like a reproductive uh, reproduction technology like sp uh, collecting sperm and then use that sperm to inseminate to the animal. Today, Ligaya and Johanna are collecting blood from a tiger for DNA analysis. They hope to mate him, but they need to make sure he has no genetic abnormalities. 
It sounds like a simple process, but how do you take blood from a large adult tiger? So this is a tiger that we are going to take the blood. Now we have this squeeze, a squeeze cage, so uh, we can uh, use this without anesthetize the animal. We will try to do it as good as possible so it won't hurt the animal. But squeezing a Sumatran tiger is easier said than done. They will need all the muscle available. The tiger won't want to be in the cage. They all need to be careful. We are going to take the blood from the vein, from the uh, tail. So first we need to uh, tonicate the tail part. After that, we need to clean a little bit the part of the tail. Using butterfly needle, we poke the part of the tail and then with 10 cc syringe, we will get the blood out from the vein. The blood will be analyzed and the DNA will be recorded in the regional stud book to find a good match for this tiger to mate with. If Salma, the female in Jambi Zoo, is brought to the breeding facility, this male could be her potential mate. But her fate is still unknown. In Burbank Forest, there are four new tiger attacks, taking the total to eight, a bloody record for Sumatra's conflict. Could there be more? than one man-eater. Tom Maddox from the Zoological Society of London believes that Salma is innocent. Two tigers killing in one area is unheard of. Salma was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. A decision has been made to relocate her. She will be moved for her own safety to a holding pen in Sumatra's Lampung province in the hope she might be released back into the wild. Dr. Johanna has been called to monitor her health for the relocation. It will take two hours to fly her to her new home. It's a tense time for Johanna. She can't risk complications from an anaesthetic, so Selma must be awake for the flight. When the plane lands, Salma is quickly taken to the holding pen where three other tigers are waiting to be released. Johanna has received some bad news from the lab. Cramped conditions at Jambi Zoo have taken their toll on Salma, the captured tiger. Uh, kemudian dari hasil uh, tes darah ada sedikit peningkatan, ada empat kali peningkatan enzim yang dikeluarkan dari hati sampai empat kali, tapi masih mungkin perlu tes untuk mengkonfirm lagi bahwa Salma is one step closer to freedom. But for now, Johanna hopes that the better facilities will make for a quick recovery.
At this facility, tigers are given live prey to eat. Most zoos don't engage in this practice, but here they want to keep these tigers as wild as possible. Their hunting instincts need to be strong to survive in the forest. Tom Maddox has come to Taman Safari Breeding Center to see the newborn cubs. He's had some devastating news. Four days after Sasa the tiger was released into the national park, his GPS collar stopped transmitting. Basically what happened, he was released at a point right on the edge of Karinchi National Park. Snares that had been set specifically for some of the mountain goat species that live there. He'd walked into one of these, broken it off its anchorage, and dragged the snare along until the anchor had got wedged in a tree, and basically had been throttled to death uh, there and then. When they reached Sasa, he was already dead, skinned, beheaded, and ready to be sold to middlemen trading in illegal tiger parts. This was a kind of um, a summary, really, of what could be happening to tigers. This is one of the only tigers we knew what was happening day by day. He survived four days in a national park before he was uh, killed by snares. So it's just a glimpse of what could be happening to all sorts of other tigers in the area. Salma, the young female, is still waiting to be released. But nobody knows if she will survive captivity or if released, will she suffer the same fate as Sasa? The tiger that attacked in Jambi has yet to be caught. And on the 21st of March, 2010, another killing in the same area, taking the total to nine, a record for Jambi. The conflict continues. These incidents have proved something to Tom about the future of this species, and it's a stark realization of what must be done to save them. There's really two things that Sumatran tigers need. The first thing is habitat. They need enough places and big enough places. And secondly, they need poaching control. That's poaching of tigers, but also poaching of their prey and the whole wildlife trade network that drives all that. Sumatran tigers have survived in Indonesia for thousands of years. Adapting to changing conditions, they've managed to keep themselves alive. But humans destroying their habitat may be one thing they cannot survive. Tom has been invited to the nursery by Johanna to meet the newest additions, two-month-old cubs Weera and Yuda. It's a special day for Tom a rare opportunity to get so close to these tigers. Yuda's beginning to swallow solid food. He'll make a full recovery. In January this year, WWF camera traps captured the world's first footage in the wild of a Sumatran tigress and her two one-year-old cubs. This footage gives hope that there is still natural forest that can support tigers. But incredible sights like this are very rare, and until Sumatra's remaining forests can be protected, Indonesia's last tigers will remain on the brink.